when I got to advanced training in the 100 at Nellis in November of 1960 time period, I ejected on takeoff. And the, the result of a fire uh, explosion in the, uh, the end of, the, of that particular airplane. So that gave me another impression of, of, of the 100. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Major General Russ Violet, U.S. Air Force retired, started his flying career on a farm in Montana. He joined the Air Force in the early 1960s and would fly over 3,000 hours in the incredible North American F-100 Super Sabre. And for our conversation today, the even more incredible Republic F-105 Thunder Chief. The thud to you, me, and of course him. Russ flew 126 missions over Laos and North Vietnam in the 60s and had multiple deployments elsewhere. The general commanded tactical air wings and ended up as the chief of the U.S. training mission in Saudi Arabia. When he retired, he ended up at the Pima Air and Space Museum, and the general was the first person I interviewed there after my chat with Scott. So it was fascinating to find out about those early deployments to Vietnam and what it was like flying the thud in combat. Just a quick point, the general does punctuate his points by tapping on the table a little bit, so you're going to hear that throughout the episode. But of course, we need to start at the beginning and find out how a boy from Montana ends up flying a supersonic nuclear strike fighter bomber. That's a long story, but the short story is that um, my mother had uh, four brothers that were in World War II, Mm -hmm. and they flew B-17s out of England. And when they came home, uh, one of them got a got a an airplane to work on the ranch and the farm Mm -hmm. to work the cattle and so he had a super piper and he'd give me a 30-30 rifle and I'd get in the back seat of that piper and he'd fly the coolies and the creeks and the other stuff and we were hunting coyotes Mm -hmm. and he says you can shoot anything you want to except the wings (laughs) so, (laughs) so I started that I fell in love with flying with him uh, in that time period, and said, "Well, that's that's pretty good." Another reason for for falling in love with flying was I grew up in northern Montana against the Canadian border, and we had uh, quite a few cattle, and so we were feeding cattle. And in the winter time, uh, it would be 30 or 40 below zero, and you're out there pitching hay to to cattle. And you look up in the blue sky, and there's contrails up there. The F-84 fighters that I didn't know at the time who were flying uh, SAC strategic mm-hmm. missions against with 47s out of out of Great Falls, Montana. Yeah. And I said, "Boy, that looks like a nice way to live." And I, compared to <laughs> freezing to death, my dad giving me a drink of whiskey to warm up when I was, you know, 10 years old on the haystack. <laughs> so I, I got enthusiastic about flying, and I didn't know anything about it. Um, another uncle also flew, but he he, uh, he he encouraged me to do that. But the real reason I got in the Air Force uh, was I went to University of Denver. Uh, Korea was uh, just ending in '54 in that time period, but the draft was on, and to maintain a deferment, you had to have a be in college, enrolled in college. Part of the process of enrolling in college was uh, was to join ROTC. And when I got in the... Just, res- just, just for my listeners over in Europe, what's ROTC? Reserve Officer Training Corps. Okay. And so that was at all the universities and colleges around mm-hmm. the country. And so they had little detachments. Yep. And they would, you would have 10, 15, 20 people or 30 people. Larger schools had 100, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So you'd get in that and you'd go through the, the military exercises and training and that sort of thing in preparation to be commissioned when you graduated from college in a, in a particular service. But there were registration lines to sign up for, for Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, ROTC. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Army line was long and the Navy line was a little bit longer. It was, the Air Force line was very short, so I went to that one. <laughs> <laughs> and really, that's how I got in the Air Force. <laughs> Yeah, picking the short queue is always always the best option. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, I went to that, and, and uh, four years later, I was commissioned a second lieutenant and, and went to pilot training. So, 
what was pilot training like in 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 the sort of middle to late fifties? Because we we sort of have this idea, our our brains, for the younger ones, we have that idea of nineteen forties Harvard's T sixes things like that, and then we jump forward to today, and it's it's a little bit different. But right. in in that interesting period of the the dawn of the jet age, what was it like? Well, uh, when I went to uh, primary. T-34s, Beach T-34 mm-hmm. was the first aircraft that I flew in the Air Force in, in that training program. And then you got 30 hours in that particular airplane. And then you graduated to the to the North American T-28. Mm-hmm. And you flew another four months in that airplane and achieved about, uh, about 100 hours altogether in those two training programs. After that six-month period, you went to uh, another base. Uh, and T-33s mm-hmm. were the trainer aircraft at that time. And I'd look up and see that jet go across the field, and oh my God, I'm gonna fly that thing, you know? <laughs> and at, at any rate, it was, uh, that was in the summer of 59. And in January of 60, I graduated from pilot training. And at that time, you had 230 hours of training mm-hmm between the T-33 and the 34 and the 28. And based on on how you did in your academics and how you did in your flying activities, uh, you had you were rated and ranked in the <laughs> class. And I, I was happened to be ranked number one in the class I was in. And so they had F-100s as uh, one of the three aircraft. And 40 people that were going to be assigned aircraft and 40 aircraft available. <laughs> so they went by the rank in the class and you'd pick her. And so I picked the 100 and then there was two other 100s that were gone. And at any rate, you went to Luke to go to, to a F-100 training at that time. So it was just, you know, it was, it was just, it went by step by step, but it went by pretty fast. Yeah. But. So the, the F-100's an interesting aircraft because it's the start of that century series, right. so-called. It was a big leap forward in in, a, in aircraft design. Did you, what did you heard of, what had you heard about it before you, you got onto it? Because it, I guess the reputation of it preceded it. Well, what I, I really hadn't heard much because I hadn't paid any attention other than the fact that it was a, it was a day fighter. Yes. And, and I, I wanted it. that seemed like something I wanted to do, but I didn't know anything about it. And, and, and so the, it, the, be, the best way then. <laughs> yeah. And the, the reality there is that that uh, went through the pilot training in that in, in the 100. Uh, when I got to advanced training in the 100 at Nellis in November of 1960 uh, time period, uh, I ejected on takeoff. And the, the result of a fire uh, explosion in the aft end of, the, of that particular airplane. Uh, so that gave me another impression of, of, of the 100. <laughs> and the, the, my father had taught me several years before that when the horse bucks you off, you get back on and you ride him again. So that's what they did to me in the F-100. The next day, they put me back on 100 and we flew another mission. And then they sent me on leave for a week. <laughs> so so, so, the, so you, I could think about it. So you're a bit battered after ejecting and they throw you straight back into it. Right. Yeah. yeah. But the one, 100 was a, it was a fun airplane to fly. Uh, I liked it. Uh, uh, at that time, I, I was... Uh, in the service for five years. I thought I was going to be in the service for five years. I was going to feel that full commitment. And then I was going back to the farm. That's what my wife and I thought at that point in time. But then as I continued on through the, the, that airplane and mas- the Masawa experience, I think I like this life. I mm-hmm. think I like flying in jets. I think I like doing these things. And so then I accepted an assignment to the 105 in the November of 63 and uh before we get on to the third what was it like being sort of deployed out to japan in the early 60s because it's i've you know reconstruction going on have heavy time of change in japan and you're there with the air force what what was that like well the, the, 
they were fixed. You know, the community I was in was Masawa, which was at the very northern end of Honshu, mm -hmm. and uh, the people there were extremely friendly. And it, I mean, it was just unbelievably how how friendly they were. My wife had a maid, and uh, so you know the socks were ironed, <laughs> and so the, my underwear was ironed, and, uh, and so so it was a very friendly, very. I, I, I don't know how I feel about ironing. Yeah, that. right. <laughs> and so the, you know, we we'd eat in the downtown areas, but the, it was a very rural, mm -hmm. very remote kind of a of a lifestyle there. And the housing was, uh, you know, minimal, if you will, but but we had fun there, and we liked the people, uh, and uh, we had a lot of wonderful relationships. But the reason we were in Japan was that you couldn't have nuke weapons in Japan, and you were sitting nuclear alert in Korea. So on on the Thursday mornings, there was a C-124 showed up at Masao, and and 30 pilots got on board, and they flew to Kunsan, and we had 30 nuclear lines at Kunsan. And the 30 guys that were there got on an airplane and went back to Japan. So they, so Wednesday morning went over, and Wednesday night she came back, she was there. We, you did that every other week no, right. for, for three years. <laughs> <laughs> so the, and it was because of the nuclear structure that you yeah. playing that game. So. So we spent a lot of time away from home, uh, and so th the things associated with those kinds of activities and being away from family uh, all added to you know issues. Mm. Uh, but you, being the first assignment, everybody worked together and you made it happen. And you had a lot of fun doing it, and enjoyed it, and put on plays, and did dumb things, and <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. But it was a, it was a very much a. a a, a very learning experience from from learning how to meet and greet people and and uh, get by with them, but that led you into the thud. So you you get into the Air Force with the dreams of being a day fighter pilot, and you end up in essentially yeah you know, tactical strike aircraft. Right. Um, now we say to that, but tactical nuclear strike aircraft because the the f-105 is it's a big airplane with a very wide range of capabilities so when you get on in 63 what what were you being trained to do on it well the the, the training program in those days was still oriented around uh, nuke mm -hmm. so the, the ground schools included you know how was this bomb built and how did it go and what caused it to go up and the, probably that game so each one of the of the series of bombs that were involved in that time period, you learn, and then the interface with, with the airplane and how how it worked. In the thud, it was of course you, you had them on the on the inboard stations on the wings and or in the bomb bay, uh, and so as you as you approach the the, the 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 nuclear weapon aspect for training program, that's what it was all concentrated on. The conventional side of the house, you know, skip bomb strafe. 30 degree dive, 45 degree dive, those games firing the M9 uh, missile at a five inch rocket with a flare on it or that sort of thing uh, yeah. to, to learn that conventional kind of activities. Uh, we didn't, they didn't, the THUD didn't have any radar missiles, uh, it's all, all heat seekers uh, or the gun. So you, you were concentrated on nuke. So I would say about you know, 60 to 70 percent of the training program was associated with flying low levels, ending up on a target, delivering a simulated nuke weapon. And, and when you were on the range, you were delivering nuclear weapons from a, from a pattern, you know, over the shoulder or toss or dive or what have you. Uh, but that was all oriented to the nuke. So we had very little experience in the in the conventional world. You, you all learned how to do that in the 100. You learned how to do it more so in the in the HUD. But if you were delivering it, strafing at uh, 400 in the, thud, in the 100, you were strafing at 540 or 600 in the HUD, and, and, and that sort of thing. So the slant, slant ranges at point of fire Everything's a bit off. further back, and everything's yeah. happening a bit quicker. Right, right. but the uh, conventional side of it got very little emphasis, and, and you know the 
there was, there was no threat except nuclear threat in the world, so to speak. Nobody was was preparing to fight a conventional war against somebody else. Yeah. We certainly weren't. And uh, so, so I suppose we've we've been saying thud since we come on. Yeah. Why was it called the thud? Well, <laughs> uh, there are many reasons, <laughs> and there, none of them are true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're spoiling it for me, Joe. <laughs> well, well, one of the stories goes that uh, when you're fighting against somebody that was using tanks, you landed the thud near the tank and taxied over, raised your gear, and squashed it, and you went thud. <laughs> and the other reasons was that the engine... The combination of engine and uh, lithium batteries uh, caused the airplane to blow up quite frequently early on, mm. and so the sound of a of a thud is was a thud blowing up and crashing, and so it was making a lot of thuds, and <laughs> so that sort of thing. But it became a very affectionate name, uh, one that anybody that's got I've got uh, 1,600 hours in the, of flying time in the thud. Uh, and 230 combat missions in the thud, but, but it became something that, you know, you really liked the airplane. It, if you, uh, it was built for you. You didn't have to get cross-handed to play games with switches and other stuff, you know, like the F-4 was horrible uh, for the pilot interface issues, and so in the 105, you know, everything was right where it's supposed to be. If you if you're dropping a 750-pound bomb from the inboard station, you could flip open a box and pull out a little, you know, printed circuit and stick it in that circuit, and it would give you the parameters for the bomb. And, and so, so you had a constant solution site, not the way it became a constant solution site, but it became a, a better predictor. <laughs> so you because you had to use your radar altimeter and some of that stuff to make that work. And that was all kind of, you know, very, very early on in that stage. And they didn't do that very well. Because in the reading I've done for it, it is that really ergonomic aircraft, classic sort of public design of doing what it needs yeah. needs to do. But you're saying there that for different parameters, you've literally got to put different circuits into the aircraft to do it. So it's not like we would see today that you flip a switch and you right. change your parameter. Right. You literally manually are... And that and that was one step beyond just the manual set the dial in your mills and, mm. and 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 select the bomb and release it with the pickle button. That was I mean that was basically what was going on there. And then they went to this step I just talked about. And then they went to the next step past uh, past that where you had a the pipper was predicting where the bomb would hit if you know, based on uh, the parameters that that box gave you so so you flew the pipper to the target and, and and the pipper would predict the bomb so so if you were within a hundred knots or so of, of what you're supposed to be at and if you were somewhere close on the other parameters dive angles and slant ranges well it was pretty accurate but but you guys get screwed up and you know and they're supposed to be dropping at 560 and they'd be at be at 440 or something, and so the bomb was falling short, or you know, all, all the things that are associated with with uh, trajectories, yeah, <laughs> and time of flight. So it, it, thing. it's going to help you, but you still have to do do the right things, do the math, get That's get right. everything. Into That's the right. right place. Exactly right. So your your for, first tour, what what was the what was the word like to come onto that? Because you're switching from nuclear to conventional. Um, did you have much time to, to prepare for it before deployment out to, to Vietnam, or was no, it? No, we were, uh, it went this way. We were doing that conventional training, mm -hmm. um, uh, nuclear training at McConnell. Uh, I forgot the exact dates, but on April 1st, the sirens went off. We went to the squadron. I said, go home, pack your bags. You're going to deploy tomorrow. The next, uh, actually two days later, we took 18 airplanes, and we got airborne, and we flew to Hawaii. The next day, we flew to Guam. The next day, we flew to Tok Lee. And two days later, we were bombing conventional in, 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 wow. in Vietnam, in North Vietnam. 
and in Laos, because Laos was a secret war at that time. Yeah. But, uh, th that was all the warning we had. We didn't, we didn't get any front-end warning. We just went, and then the squadron sorted it out. That's what happened to all of them. All the squadrons had to sort out what was going on, where, what altitude should we be at, where should we be going, uh, you know, what was good, what worked, what didn't work. And so... so le learning by doing very yeah, much. Yeah. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So... But it was there was no prep phase. There was no you know you're gonna go you know you got two months to work up. Never happened. You just went. You just you were you were where you were in that conventional nuclear training program. And the ne next week, literally, you were bombing conventional in North Vietnam. And so that that drove a lot of decisions that you you know about, I'm sure, but. Uh, Part of the biggest uh, uh, result of that early experience was red flags. Yes. And the red flags produced the structure to get people through those initial days and initial training programs so that they, you were losing all most of your people that you were losing. You know, 70% of them were being lost in the first 10 hours, mm -hmm. or first 10 missions, rather. And, and so, uh, because they were making stupid mistakes and uh, doing things they shouldn't be doing. They still did it. Yeah. And, and other things happened, of course. Yeah. But, but. What were the conditions like when you arrived in Vietnam? Because there's, I suppose today a deployment is, there's a lot of planning that will go into it, a lot of prep, a lot of pre-deployment uh, pre yeah. out there. Like you said, you, you in six yeah. days you've gone from the States to, to flying off. Yeah. Oh, so we go, so we, I'll, I'll just use Doc Lee as an mm -hmm. example. Uh, this was in 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 uh, '65 mm -hmm. when that happened. Now, the, the U.S. had been involved in Vietnam uh, since '62. They were flying mm -hmm. missions out of out of uh, Bangkok area, mm -hmm. Don Juan Air Base, and they were flying into Laos and flying into North Vietnam uh, for four years before this happened, for three years before this happened. So there was an experience there. So what does that mean? Well, there was an infrastructure, so you had a, you had a dining hall and mess halls and sleeping quarters, and you knew where the hangars were and da-da-da-da-da, open, open stuff. And so that was all. You filled into that when you deployed in 65. You filled into that because that other program kind of went away. And, yeah. and it wasn't there, but that's, that's who absorbed you, who 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 you fell in into the circuitry with uh, the people that were in charge of the war at that time down in 7th Air Force, 2nd Air Division at the time. But, uh, but it, uh, you know, the, it was uh, the barracks, they're, they're on stilts, uh, screened in porches in, in, in the spring, summer of, of 65, you know, you were running 105 degrees, 110 degrees, uh, and you put uh, eight 750s on a thud, you know, that'd take you up to 53,000 pounds. And uh, release brakes, 4,000 foot of roll, you'd check for 140 knots, and at 180 knots, you'd raise the nose, and at 210 knots, you got airborne. And, and, and gear, Flaps at 275, out of burner at 350, and climb at 400 to the tanker. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, you know, that sort of thing. But it's uh, not. anyway. Well, let, let, let's sort of talk about those 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 early missions. So you, you, that's always when you come at it from someone like me reading books. It's it's those little details on it. You sort of think, well, you take off, you fly, you find the target, you bomb the target, you come home. But it, it's not, it's all those little elements of getting to the tanker because you've, you're heavy, it's hot, it's high. You don't have the performance to do what you might have been doing in, in training back home. How were those early missions for you as a young man um, on your first proper combat deployment? Well, the thud was flying up, you know, we'd fly up, at, up to the targets at, uh, you know, 20 to 25,000 feet. And we were indicating about 400 knots, and, and uh, it was just, it was very comfortable. The, the airplane didn't know that it had all those bombs on it. It didn't seem like it. And so how did you find the target? Well, 
and there was a lot of mapping going on, but you had, you, you had the, the facts were already there. And so they were working from that previous time period. Yeah. There were other people in there, so the Magia Pass and Don Boy and these other places, uh, they, they thought they had a truck park or a, they wanted to cut the road or they wanted to do that. Well, you'd get in contact with that individual and and they would throw a white phosphorus rocket into that and hit my smoke. And that's how we found the target, would hit that smoke. And uh, go, you know, go 100 meters right, and short of that smoke, there's, a, there's something in that ground. Pick that up, that, there's a truck park right there. Bomb that truck park. So we bombed a lot of trees. <laughs> 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 but that's, that's what we were finding. And that's so, so it's uh, the, the 750 pound bomb was, was the bomb that we used almost all the time. So we didn't have, didn't have any high, there was no high drags. There was no laser guided. There was nothing, everything was dumb bomb uh, type thing. And, and the only thing that was different was uh, you put extenders on the fuses so that you could get the bomb to go off before it actually hit the ground. So, so if you, so it's not punching through the trees; it's sort of going off the treetop, sort of. Right, yeah. right. So you're working, working that a lot. So, you, so you're working a, you know, from a 45 degree dive for the most part, and so you would, uh, you were, since we were flying in at 20,000, you didn't have any problem finding enough altitude to, to get the dive angle you wanted, and and so sometimes you went down lower in order to. Uh, uh, work with the fact and get the spot and then you'd back off and, and pop up and back down into it but so you, you do multiple passes it wouldn't be a, a full drop well on that was center. that was one of the one of the rules was uh, uh, you dropped all bombs every on one pass mm -hmm. because multiple passes we learned the hard way early on that if you make a second pass and a third pass on the same target you're going to get your ass shot up <laughs> and so that's that's where that came from. Is, you know, no second passes. The second pass, if you're going to make a second pass, we did that a, uh, quite a bit. One of my flight leaders, one of or the guys I flew with, assigned that you know, okay, let's go bombs, bombs duel, and we'll make three passes. So you hit that target with the first two. Four miles down the road, you hit a second target. Yeah. And three miles down the road, you hit another target. Mm -hmm. So you had two bombs for each one of them. Off you go. So let's talk about the opposition. What what would you be facing on on those on those ops? Uh, primarily thirty-seven and fifty-seven millimeter uh, uh, anti-aircraft guns. Mm -hmm. There were uh, quad 23s, 24s, uh, uh, and they were vicious. Uh, and after a few sorties, uh, uh, we established internal maps with the, with the guys in the squadron and the intel and that sort of thing. And we called it, you know, there's some nine level gunners right there, and, and those three level gunners over here, you guys take care of that. We'll take care of these guys over here. So while you're learning uh, tactics to, to defeat the nine level guys, uh, you know, we were losing some airplanes. We lost, we lost seven airplanes in that first four months. Goodness. And, and, uh, and it had, had four guys killed in that process. So, uh, so, so it wasn't just, you know, go fly and go back and drink at the bar. It didn't, didn't work that way. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with some of our Korean War vintage aircraft. Um, here is our F-86E Sabre, um, which was the preeminent American jet fighter during the Korean conflict. Um, originally, we were flying a lot of straight wing aircraft like the F-84 and, you know, reciprocating engine aircraft still like the Mustang, various other aircraft. Um, when this aircraft made its debut, the MiG-15, which was used by the North Koreans um, with also probably some help from other nations. Um, but it was a game changer, swept wings, had a cannon, and really 
you know, overpowered anything with a straight wing. Um, around that time, our F-86 started coming into Korea, which the two aircraft were pretty equally matched. Uh, armament aside, you know, the uh, F-86 had 50 calibers, while the MiG had, I believe, 20 millimeter cannons, if I recall correctly, three. Um, so 30 millimeter, I think it was. 30, was it 30 millimeter? Two, two, two 30, 220, something, something like that, yeah. Okay. Cannon. Not the armaments. It, they're cannons, the first machine guns, yeah. which has always been a big argument. You know, the Americans were always full in on the 50 cal and the machine gun side of things, while a lot of other nations tended to lean towards cannons. You know, so depends who you ask which is the better air, aerial weapon. But our F-86 is actually a real combat veteran. We would the 51st fighter interceptor wing. Um, it's a bit of a Franken airplane. The fuselage did come from the a Korean War veteran. The wings did come from another aircraft, but that was one of those things where we decided to go with obviously the identity of the fuselage, which you know has the more interesting history and has an actual Korean War combat provenance. Um, it could be a little bit of a time too to talk about our curatorial choices with paint schemes. Yes. Usually we always try to paint our aircraft in markings that are historically accurate for that aircraft. This F-86 is an example of this. The markings on the aircraft are based on photographic evidence from the Korean War of this aircraft. Our MiG-15, on the other hand, like most surviving MiGs in a lot of collections, is a Polish MiG. It's not a Korean MiG. But because for this, we decided we wanted to tell the story of the Korean War, so we did paint this aircraft in North Korean markings, where usually we don't do that. Um, we usually always try to paint the aircraft for, uh, you know, the historically accurate markings for that aircraft. But like I said, once in a while when we have another story to tell, we'll uh, make an assumption. Also, if we painted all our MiGs, they would all be pretty much in Polish markings instead of uh, representing some of the different um, Warsaw Pact nations like we have. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. I, I, I guess that's where the tactics you've been training on are constantly developing. You're, you're trying new things, you're, you're experimenting, and... How, of, how often did something work well out of the box? Yeah, I, I always have this weird idea of someone coming up with a bright idea and it's either good or bad, well, or is it being adapted? It's in, the, in that time period, the surface of our missile uh, began to surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, so the, the problem was nobody had any tactics uh, that, uh, of how, how to kill a surface to air missile. Uh, sight or a surface or how to defeat a surface air missile in the air mm -hmm. uh, so the experience there started to, to be written down by the by the weapons officers at Takli and in Karat so Karat developed a tactics manual and Takli developed a tactics manual and Karat uh, believed in in uh, a higher altitude. They were worked in from 15, 16, 18,000 feet entries. And Tuckley believed in a 7,000 to 8,000 foot entry in that time period. Uh, when you look at the statistics of losses and that sort of thing, there's not wasn't much difference. But nevertheless, uh, that's where the attack portion of it was. I I guess I need to back off and say. Uh, I was on the first raid ever against a surface air missile site. Wow. So, so that was the 27th of July in 1965. And so uh, a couple of days before that, we'd been bombing in the area. And, and uh, one of the targets uh, was uh, uh, had a recce flight that was working at uh, and another attack element into it. And two aircraft in the recce flight of four were shot down on the 25th of July. And suddenly, all the off limits where we couldn't get within 30 miles of this and couldn't get within 10 miles of that and couldn't overfly this, suddenly all that went away and we were, we were assigned surface to air missile site X and Y. 
and uh, Tuckley was attacking from the northwest, escaping southwest, and then Corot was attacking from the southwest, escaping northwest, and little did we realize that our targets were in a, two miles apart, and we were head on at the target, and they gave us TOTs at the same time, and, and so we were flying through each other at the target level, you know, at, on the deck, uh, we were we were delivering. I was delivering at 600 knots at 100 feet, and, and so, and so you'd got a, you had you had 85 millimeters, 100, 100, 85 millimeters, 57s, that sort of thing, and you're flying through the berms and flying through the flak yeah. of those things going off. Explosions in the cockpit just were just overbearing. It was unbelievable. You know, the smoke and the donuts, and you're flying through that stuff into that SAM site. So. Uh, so you were flying across the SAM site. There were six locations. In after the raid, I'll jump ahead a little ways. After the raid, we discovered that when they shot that recce airplane down on the 25th, uh, they moved a mobile SAM site out of that site, and they have put dummy weapons in wood dummies in or wood buildings in to replicate the site. So that's what we killed. That's what we, we, we got all that off. We lost six more airplanes in that process. But. So it's, it's, it's constant cat and mouse. It's, it's finding target then changing the target yeah. and you trying to yeah. find the new one and, yeah. and so, suffering losses along yeah. the way. But, the, but again, the tactics of, were being developed and there's a lot of mistakes made. A lot of electronic countermeasures were being developed. A lot of equipment had been built. Uh, a lot of equipment was available uh, in the system, uh, but it was never deployed. It was never put in place, so you didn't have anything that you could counter our SAMS radars with. You had, uh, all our equipment, the electronic countermeasures equipment, they had 160 of those pods at Kadena, and they were never deployed to the to the unit in the 65 time period. It was later in, later in 66 before they got the, those sites down there. They called the 160 pods, but nevertheless, it was a huge mistake on the part of egos that people wanted to go conventional. Uh, and they were, we're going to dive bomb it. That's it. You know. mm -hmm. And the, the people that, on the other side that had the electronic, or, I mean, the uh, electronic capabilities to attack you. Uh, find you and attack you. Uh, they disregarded it, but they, they uh, it was a terrible mistake. That's good. So, so what, what did you have um, going in in '65 to let you know that you were being tracked or, or being painted by a? Well, you had a, you had a, it was a sensor system uh, where you had a, a little scope that, with a, with a target uh, X. What am I trying to say? That uh, anyway, so receptacle. In every, the, yeah. yeah. When a radar site came up, it made a certain noise, to, so you knew that that was the acquisition radar, and mm -hmm. so it would show up on that scope, based on the range uh, out at the edge or in closer to where you were mm -hmm. in the middle, and, and so it was there. Then it would switch from an acquisition mode. To, I mean, a, a search mode to an acquisition mode where they're getting ready to lock onto you, it, it would be a different radar. You know, it would pop up and you, you could hear it and you could, you could recognize that it was there. And so then you took evasive actions as necessary if, if, you, if, it, was on, if it was on your 12 o'clock, if it was over on, the, on your wingtips, uh, that sort of thing. It didn't pay too much attention to it except that you... you uh, maybe dropped your altitude, that's, that sort of thing. But you, you were flying again, in these cases, like I said before, in the seven, 8,000 to 15,000 foot range. So there was a lot of, uh, if the missile was fired, uh, then you've got, a, you've got a, another beep in there because it's a command guided thing yep. and not a self guided system. So you had a, one man on azimuth, one man on range, uh, one man, one man on speed, uh, that sort of thing. And so there was a guy sitting behind that on the, the other side, and he's blowing the missile based on when he thinks it's going to be closest to you. So, yep. he, so you defeated that by, 
by changing your vectors in at least two directions. So you, if you were going this way, you, you get over and pull down hard and try to increase speed and or lose altitude, gain altitude, whatever, right. but change, change in mode. So they had to maneuver it to get to you. And, and at that point, that, that SAM-2 missile was nearing the end of its uh, powered flight or was already through the powered flight phase, which is only about 35 seconds. And so it would sit there, it would get up to Mach 3 in that time period, but then it would start to drift back. Uh, and so if you could get past that, that 35 seconds, 40 seconds time period, then the missile was going to die on its own. But if you were in that front end load area, you better get some, some, some action going on your end of the stick or you're going to be in the middle of it. It must have been a terribly long 35 seconds. Oh, yeah. It, uh, a year and a half. <laughs> no, not really. But I mean, it was. I, I didn't. I didn't personally ever have that problem. But that, that's what the issue was, and that's what they were doing. Because I was there early in the war, and I was there again in the middle of the war. And there was a bombing phase when I was when I was there in the '69 time period. Had, what what had changed between the two tours? Because, you know, be, being there early, I, I guess it's everybody getting used to each other almost. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's some of that. Mm -hmm. But one of the problems was that everybody, you know, the policies of the, of the Air Force uh, was that everybody got gets to go once before they have to go twice. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means that if you're flying a C-47 or a 135 or, or some other aircraft, uh, you were going to go to a replacement training unit and learn how to fly the 105 or the F-4 or the F-100, and then you're going to go over and you're going to do your thing. There are a lot of people that were in those categories that were were eliminated. They took their wings away from them because they wouldn't fly the mission. They, they didn't want to fly combat. They didn't want to do that sort of thing, so they took, the, they took their wings away from them. So they, they had the, all this emotion going on and so they got that straightened out and you know he, he was flying he was a hundred percent c-47 pilot and he's doing a great job put him back on c-47 why are you kicking him out for god's sakes <laughs> so, <laughs> no, that, that sort of thing so they went through these imaginations of, of trying to satisfy everybody's desire but you say everybody learned well it's a whole. It was a whole new world. Every six months, every 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 couple of months, whatever, you know, another group of people came in that were had no previous combat experience, no previous maybe tactical experience. Maybe they all came out of Air Defense Command, uh, so they were they were very vulnerable to uh, their experience, yeah. and uh, so that we had we lost four of those guys, Air, air Defense types early on in our 65 time period. That didn't happen in 69, although we, uh, primarily in 69, we lost people because they were attacking a target too often, mm -hmm. or, or they were, uh, we were, they were experimenting with some weapons. The system was that uh, uh, it, it just didn't work. Yeah. The I'm trying to form this question really, but how those those two tours in in that period of time, you've you've got, you know, for 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 someone like me who's only read about it, this is my my first opportunity to to chat to somebody who was there. It's it's hard to you know maybe pull my mind away from the silly stuff, the movies, the, the things like that, and yeah, Stephen Koontz's books, Flying A6s, and, yeah. and, and things like that, which are great fun. Yeah. But you know, talking to you and, and sort of understanding that the learning curve was so steep that it was, you know, it, it's probably something familiar to fighter pilots and, and bomber pilots of, of every war going into something, the, the thing that's trained for is not the thing that you're going to face. Right. As as someone who then achieved high rank in the Air Force, how did your experience then funnel into how you then commanded later on? Well, good question. Uh, 
that experience was that you know, we do not need to expose people to these threats when we've got all this capability, all this electrical capability. We're working the, our tails off in research and development and all these other programs. You can't leave it in the hangar. You got to get it out there and get it on the airplane and use it. And and you'll save lives. You'll save people. You, know, you don't need to. You know, that was that was uh, to me one of the biggest things that that came out of my my experience from primarily '65. But uh, so the the guy that was leading the Air Force in this '90s war, uh, Anders Schwarzkopf, a big guy by the name of Chuck Horner. Uh, uh, he worked for me. Okay, and he later became a four star, but he's, he, he worked for me. And so he and I worked with Grumman and worked with uh, Westinghouse, worked with, uh, mm, uh, let's just say there's uh, very special programs at Georgia Tech and da 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 da. Yeah. And so he worked with a lot of these people to, to get these things set up. And so then, then it was a matter of pushing. Uh, the advocacy program to get the the links, the electronic links that you had to have between your airplane and your weapon, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that you could do these things. And so, uh, that was my my influence to me was was uh, you know, we got to keep the guy at a distance from from where that threat is when we can use weapons. Uh, to do that with, and, and so we can save people, and we, and we don't need to put your aircraft at risk in that process. If we de develop weapon systems that, you know, starting out with you know, very short distances, but if developing into 10 mile, 15 mile, 40 mile uh, scenarios or J dams now, you yeah. know, 100 miles, whatever, and so you can play some games with that, and so you don't have to get in the middle of the fireball. Uh, in order to kill the target, and so, and I, and I guess that gives you many more options for attack as well. The, right, right. The, the getting over the target and going old school with a dive bomb is is one option, but also standing off. Well, well. it's in, you know these weapons are cost a lot of money, but if you look at a look at a cost chart, if you will, and if you, conventional weapons like World War II and uh, Ploesti, you know those things. They put that square over that target, and they wanted a 90% kill program. So they had to put enough sorties across that box mm -hmm. to get a bomb in every one of those squares in that box, you know. And so they they put a lot of people and a lot of airplanes and a lot of ordnance in that square to get a 90% kill factor. Whereas now, you want to you, know, you, you want to invert that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, so if you get something or that instead of spending a lot of bombs and that sort of thing, you spend a lot of money and you get you get a weapon for four hundred dollars, I mean four hundred thousand dollars, and you get a if you fire the weapon, you're probably going to get a one hundred percent probability of kill, <laughs> and that's that's you know it's a big difference. Yeah. And, and so the number of aircraft required and the number of so you got you got to keep your storage site up. So you got all that expensive stuff to use, but but if you don't, you know, where we are now is we're, we're in a disaster zone um, because you're not replacing that stuff at the same rate that you're using it. Yeah. And, uh, but that's another problem. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that, that you know that that's fascinating because that uh, legacy that we sort of saw come to fruition in the early '90s um, really did sort of. Change the game because that, that idea of you know, where the effort goes, the the airframe, the training of, of, of the crew, make that as reusable as possible, keeping them out of harm's way was something that um, I, I suppose to a degree has um, inured the public a little bit. They they think it's a bit more video gamey than it actually is. Yeah. Um, do do you think that there's today? A misunderstanding of what the capability actually is, because of maybe the briefings we saw on, on CNN of Stormy Norman watching a laser-guided bomb hit a bridge. Well, it's, probably, mm. yeah. Uh, uh, it's hard v to say. Ve it's, very complex, abstract question. Yeah, I know, it's, but it's, it's, it's hard to say. Mm. Yeah, the. the, the uh, let's, Bunch, bunch of us have said that that uh, 
how do I say this and still keep my senses? <laughs> it's, uh, they get enamored with the capability of some of the electronics mm -hmm. and some of the other structure. Whereas if you just, put, uh, you and I, let's go out and get that airplane and we'll go hit that target and we'll use 20 millimeter on it and we'll come back. We we probably could have killed every nuclear, every surface air missile site in North Vietnam using that technique, and just turn those guys loose like like uh, instead of waiting for a frag order from the White House uh, to go out there and attack it with X, Y, and Z type munitions from some distance because those guys well that's another but but you didn't didn't need all that. Because if you if you hit this target and this target and this target and you keep it under constant fire, there's, there's not going to be a problem. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that was one of the lessons that came out of it is that there's just stupid tactics and st stupid uh, structures. I managed the weapons program for Second Air Division. If a ship came out of the United States loaded with weapons, you knew what was on that ship. If you got the ship west of 142 and changed its destination from base X to base Y, you just paid that guy a full trip as if he'd been there, went back, picked up another load, and came back to the States. Mm -hmm. So in order to avoid that, if you got him west of 142, you continued to deliver him to the same base he was originally at, but now you look at the storage site and you don't have room for the weapons that are coming in on the ship. So what do you do? You frag the weapons at that site to get rid of them so you got room for the weapons coming in. And so you put the weapon on targets it had no business being fragged against, but they were just getting rid of the weapons uh, because they didn't have space in the storage sites. Yeah. That that essentially that's you know you, you could throw that back to the First World War using shrapnel artillery shells against wire that, that doesn't yeah. work but it's what they had so they yeah. needed to yeah. get rid of right. it yeah that's, oh, that's fascinating yeah but it's, it was I it used to just drive me nuts when I had to, had to go in and change the change the ship to a different port nevertheless yeah. but, different structures <laughs> the, the, the trials and tribulations of logistics yeah yeah yeah. 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 Let, let's let's get on to something completely different, okay? Because we're, we're sat here at Pima Air and Space Museum, of, of which you you sit on the board. How did you get involved with this place? And <laughs> and, and my mate in the other room, uh, Mr. Marchand, who who's keeping me busy while I'm visiting. I think I think the easiest way to answer that is that there were some people that were already involved out here, mm -hmm. and when I got in, uh, one of them was a was a pretty close friend, and he said, "Rush, you got to come out and be a trustee at the." Uh, and I said, oh, "I don't, I don't know if I want to do that." That was in 2003, and, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I, at the time, the, the, the person that was the the chairman of the board uh, had worked for me in another in another environment, mm -hmm. and. Uh, my opinion of him was not very good. <laughs> okay. Just put it that way. Yes. Because I, I moved him from spot A to spot B, and, and uh, so I didn't have to put up with him. But nevertheless, here he was. And he was, he was in the saddle with uh, some very key people here in town mm -hmm. that were managing or wanting to develop this PMA Air Museum into something bigger than it was at the time. And so... The, they were burying this, this place in debt with the, the gate airplanes and yep. that sort of thing. Uh, you know, they put $1.4 million into those three airplanes out there. And, <laughs> you know, and that was a whole other story, you know, but that was debt. And there was three or four other projects like that, and they were, they were burying it. So at any rate, this guy that invited me to come out, we need to get this straightened out. He also happened to be the chairman of the Hall of Fame committee, and so he he quit that, and I became the that guy. Mm -hmm. And then I was working with the, the other people, and the, they managed to get a hold of the right people at, uh, locally to get Von Gallen, who was the chairman of the board that just died here about six months mm -hmm. ago, uh, into this particular area, and so we managed to 
to move everything off the debt list, if you will. You know, started went from the red zone to the black zone, and, and, and if you got a lot of money, and, and you're able to do a lot of things. But they they were very smart about how they managed that structure. Mm -hmm. And but that's this guy that got me on the board. Uh, I didn't know too much about that, but I knew enough about building industry. That was my major in, in uh, college, and I worked with uh, different S and E firms uh, as a consultant up up to that point. So I you know, started work, helping working to get new contracts to do things out here with mm -hmm. with the physical structure. The campaigns, early campaigns for money on that sort of thing, you know, were a real devil to get enough money to work that problem, and then then that kind of took care of itself when we got a couple of deep pocketed people that decided that they would help us do that. So, no, how did I how did I get involved? I was invited in and I accepted, I guess. And you've been here ever since. And I've been here ever since. Yeah. <laughs> and I, well, it's it's been a real, uh, it's been fun from the viewpoint of uh, watching airplanes uh, being made available to you, and then being able to buy them and and or bring them in and work the problem. Mm -hmm. and that's not an inexpensive process. That's, yep. and that's and so that's. That's like right now the P thirty eight and the P forty seven and they're sitting there getting ready to come. And, and so that's you know, it continues. Mm -hmm. Two years ago we were three hundred and fifty aircraft, we're up to four hundred and forty. You know, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's my wife and I went around with Andrew yesterday to, to have, have have a look and we only got around the hangars and she just turned to me and went, It's overwhelming. It's an incredible, incredible place. So the, the work that you're all doing here, for for us aviation nuts, it's it is very much a bucket list place to come because it is a remarkable collection. And well, thank thank you very much for the hard work that you're well, putting into well, keeping it going. Yeah, uh, in the reality, uh, I, I thank you. But people like myself on the board have very little to do with with the direction that mm. that has taken because he. Scott, you get Scott Marchand, uh, and his relationship with uh, money, his relationship with museums, mm -hmm. his relationship with knowledge of where things are and how much it costs and that sort of thing because of his experience and his training and his education and, and, and through the Calgary and, and the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. uh, those issues and his, yep. his experience. Uh, there isn't anybody else around that's anything like him, and you know. And so we just just gave him another big raise, but that's <laughs> <laughs> because he's vulnerable to somebody stealing him from us. And so we're going to make him expensive. <laughs> <laughs> we we had a, a fascinating chat last night over drinks. We're, we're gonna, we've recorded. We're going to put out just about the museum business in in the states and how you get aircraft and things, and it's. It was utterly fascinating, but that that passion that you mentioned and that that knowledge yeah. does come across. Yeah. And don't we, we don't want to blow too much smoke at him? But <laughs> no, I know, I know. General, this has been a fascinating chat. Thank you for spending the last little while with me. Well, I hope I've answered your questions. I'm, I think uh, that my dream of uh, flying the 105. Uh, it's my favorite aircraft by far. I've loved the, loved the machine from day one, and uh, only one time in combat did I ever bring back an airplane that had any holes in it, <laughs> you know? and, and so it treated me well. Uh, but it's an airplane that uh, uh, it goes fast, and if it does anything really well, it goes fast, and it's it's a uh, the story goes, uh, a couple of 100 pilots were were uh, up over North Vietnam on a misty mission, and and they heard a thud flight come off, and the thud leader asked to where he was, and he said, south of the target. And he says, what's your heading? And he said, west. And 
He said, what's your speed? And he says, I'm at a thousand. Roger, let's push him up and get out of here. <laughs> you know? But that thing, it had, it had speed that was just un, unmeasurable. Because you know? we'd, we'd come off target at 600 and you'd go to 850, you know, on the egress. And, and, and so that's moving right along. And it would go faster than that uh, without a problem, but, but you're your canopy seals and that sort of stuff started to melt and so you had to you had to keep it down to keep the temperature in the canopy down wow <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was and that's moving that's mm -hmm. so you're sitting there at 1400 1500 feet per second so it's, you're moving at a, a mile about every three and a half seconds or so goodness and it's getting, getting you into and out of trouble quickly yeah mm -hmm. right Oh, that's privilege. So, yeah. No, it's been my privilege. Thank you. I hope I helped. I cannot thank General Violet enough for his time. And of course, to Scott Marchand and the team at the Pima Air and Space Museum, not only for setting up that interview and the others that we still have coming, but for their incredibly generous support of the podcast, which has meant we've been able to get some really unique insights like that of the General and some of the others you've been hearing. We have more coming from them, including some fantastic trips around the museum, which the team and Ramon from Boneyard Safari have been recording and I haven't seen yet, so I'm very excited to see what they're all putting together. That will all go out as soon as I guess it, and they'll be making up the new midpoints of the episodes as well. Now, if you want to get all of that first, we have our fantastic Patreon supporters, who I've called the Damn Castiers, in a moment of inspiration because every good subscription service needs a decent name. If you want to join that, that's from £3 a month, plus a bit of that. But I know times are tough, and not everyone's in a position to do that. So if you could, and you're on things like Apple Podcasts, pop some stars into the podcast app, leave a review, let me know how I'm doing, get in touch, and say that you're liking the show. That would be fantastic. Or if you'd like things changed, let me know as well. Because at the moment, I'm planning up what we have coming for the back half of the year and there's some fun stuff coming more museum type interviews incredible books that we have coming up including my second pulitzer prize nominated author which i'm really looking forward to because his book is fantastic little teaser for that of course our first was james scott go back to episode number one for that one regardless you're all fantastic thank you ever so much for your support all the usual links are down in the description below. Please check out the Pima website for all the latest news. Give them a follow on Facebook and Instagram. And tell your friends about the pod, because that's the best way that this can get about. Until next time, thank you so much for listening, and do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.